Right. <clears throat> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this video, we are going to go over the thermodynamic unit for AP Physics 2. Uh, hopefully, you can watch this video, take some notes, um, get a little refresher so that you can do well on your uh, exam. All right. So to start us off, we're going to start off with the kinetic molecular theory. So the main points are that the atoms are always moving all the time. They cannot stop moving. Uh, the temperature of a substance is determined by the energy of the molecule. So the higher the temperature is for a substance or a system, um, that means it has more energy compared to something that has a lower uh, temperature or substance. Um, of course, more energy means more motion, and this links with the kinetic energy formula. Okay, uh, and what that means is that there, if there is more kinetic energy, then that means there is more velocity. All right. Uh, obviously, if things are moving around more, they can collide more, um, which relates to the PV equals nRT, the pressure portion. Um, in order to determine how much energy a substance has, you have to use the kinetic energy formula. Um, kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared, uh, and there's also different variations of that. Um, there's the 3 halves nRT, or the 3 halves pressure times the volume, uh, and we'll go over that later on. Um, the important thing here is that when we are looking at the kinetic energy formula, if the number of molecules uh, differ uh, for substance to substance, um, and if the velocity uh, differs from substance to substance, um, because the velocity is squared, it's going to have a greater effect uh, on the overall kinetic energy. And that is that will be a question uh, that you will see uh, whether on this exam or uh, if you take the AP exam. They love that question. Um, they love it uh, when there's two variables and one has a special relationship. Uh, in this case, it's a velocity because it's squared versus a mass, which is not squared. Okay, They love to ask questions about that. So don't forget to square the velocities. It's a squared relationship. All right. Um, if we are to look at the kinetic molecular theory graphs, they will look something like this. So we have two graphs here. One is uh, for the green gas, and one is for the "quote unquote" blue gas. Um, and by taking a look at the the graphs, I can tell that the green graph has a lower temperature because it has a lower average speed. Okay, assuming that they, we had the same number of molecules. Uh, and that's because in the kinetic energy formula, uh, the velocity is, is squared. And the blue gas has a lot more speed, uh, which means it has a lot more energy, which also translates to a higher temperature when you are com comparing the two. Okay, So uh, if we were to superimpose one on another, it would kind of look like this, Okay, where we have a red gas and we have a blue gas. Okay, So now we have two different kinds of gases. And uh, what can happen is if you have two different gases and you allow them to mix and mingle, uh, you should be able to determine uh, what the average speed or where the, the peak of the average sh speed uh, should be for the new gas. Um, so let's do a recap of this graph. The red gas has a higher amount of molecules, uh, m, but it also has a lower uh, velocity. No, that should say lower amount. Uh, the blue has a lower uh, amount of molecules, but it has a higher velocity. So uh, if we were actually given values, so we could plug them in to actually see the amount of energy that uh, is for the red and for the blue gases. Okay. All right. So next up, we have the universal gas law, PV equals nRT. Now, mind you, this is um, for the exam. It'll pertain to only for gases. Okay. All right. Now, the, this is the universal gas law, the, the version that we use for the macro scale or uh, when we are taking a look at large amounts. Okay, that's what macro means. Uh, and that's because the lowercase n stands for moles. And a mole is a ginormous number. So we use that equation when the problem is talking about like a container of gas. And it doesn't give you a specific number of molecules. Uh, we have PV equals capital N times the Boltzmann constant, KB, uh, times the temperature. And this is the universal gas law that we use for a microscale. And this is when uh, we are given a specific amount of molecules. Uh, and that's because... Um, moles is a lot like the number of moles that something has is a really really big amount um, and when not talking about a very large amount they will always give you the number of molecules or you might have to find it uh, and that will be the equation that you use okay all right so when gas has a higher temperature it also has greater amount of energy um, so it moves more which causes it to have more rates of collision and like I said uh, the more rates of collision uh, occurs that increases the the pressure and uh, we did this demo in class when we uh, expanded a balloon by heating the, the liquid inside of it, we the, the balloon increased. And um, over here in the picture, we can also see the reverse effect. Okay, If you have helium balloons 
um, or maybe even air balloons, and you leave them outside, and it gets super, super cold, what happens is that the, the balloons actually shrink. And if you bring them on, uh, inside your house where it's a lot warmer, the balloons expand again, uh, and that deals with the universal gas laws. Okay. And the, the shrinking of the balloons is because the gas molecules aren't moving around much, uh, and they aren't colliding with the outside walls of the balloon as much. Um, and so because of that, you know, it doesn't expand. Okay. All right, now let's go into PV graphs. Uh, the first one is the isobaric curve. Okay, um, bar is uh, what we use for pressure, and iso means the same. So isobaric means the same pressure. All right, uh, and this arrow here shows us a isobaric curve, um, and this red area, the shaded red area, is the work um, that is done by the system and the environment for a isobaric process. Okay, it is the area underneath the curve. And remember, the curve can be a straight line or a curved line. Uh, curve just designates a line on a graph. Now, here's uh, something that you do need to memorize. If the volume along the PV graph it increases, that means the work is done by the gas, okay? because it's doing what the gas wants to do. Um, and so when we put it into the uh, first law of thermodynamics, um, because the gas is doing the work, uh, the value we will put in would actually be a negative, okay? Because the um, first law uh, is what we are using to describe what's happening to the gas, okay? So that's a very big, important distinction. If the gas is doing the work, that means the work has to be put in as a negative, right? And we had the first law here. So delta U, meaning the change in energy, is equal to the Q, which is the heat, plus W, which is the work. So in a case like this graph to um, our right, the work that we put in would be put in as a negative value because the gas is doing the work. However, if the arrowhead is going to uh, the left, that means something is making the, the gases, uh, you're increasing the, or you're decreasing the volume that the gas can stay in, and that's going against the very nature of what gases want to do. Gases want to constantly expand. Um, and so in order, for, in order to force the gas to do something that it doesn't want to do, you're going to do work to it. Okay? You're going to force the gases to be in a smaller area. And so we put the work in as a um, positive value. All right, next up we have uh, the PV graphs for a isochoric, um, a isochoric PV graph. Uh, and isochoric means that it has the same volume. The volume doesn't change. And notice there's no shaded area. Um, and the work is indicated by the area of the curve. And because the curve is vertical, there's no area underneath of it. So therefore, there is no area under the curve no work is done during an isochoric process. So we just increase the pressure without increasing the volume itself. All right, next up we have the isothermal curves. Um, the isothermal curves looks actually like a curved line. And the important thing is that the isothermal process is, um, is slow. It must uh, occur over an extended controlled period of time. Um, and that's because if you don't do that, it becomes an adiabatic process. Okay, so the temperature is kept constant the entire time. Uh, and that is done by adjusting either the pressure or the volume and then allowing the, the system to approach the temperature that you want. Usually you ruin temperature and then you adjust it again uh, and then you allow it to adjust and then you, you change the pressure volume again and again. So that happens over an extended period of time, usually a long period of time, uh, so that you get a nice isothermal curve. Okay? So the key point here is that throughout the entire process, the system is allowed to reach equilibrium. Um, now, the important thing about this is that what it means for us is all along the, uh, the curve, we have the, the same PV values. So if we were to multiply PV at this point, PV at this point, PV at this point, and then P times V at this point, we would always get the same number um, because it represents the, the energy at that given point, and it will always be the same. All right, now here we have three different gases uh, showing us the three different isothermal lines. Now, while taking a look at this, um, the first thing that you would notice is that uh, the blue line is uh, the first to the right and the green light is furthest to the left. And with that knowledge, that actually tells us a lot. So the isotherms that are higher up represents a higher temperature and higher energy um, because we get the energy once again by multiplying the pressure and the volume, and of course by three halves, but that's always a constant. Uh, and because the, um, the product of the pressure and volume uh, will result in a bigger number, it results in a bigger energy uh, product. Um, next up, we have the adiabatic process. Now, the adiabatic process is the most easily confused because it actually looks a lot like a isotherm. Um, the adiabatic process is what the isotherm would look like if um, the process was not done over a slow and extended and controlled period of time. It happens like that. Okay, it happens quickly, and most of the times, uh, 
in our lives, um, the processes are adiabatic. Uh, for example, breathing is a adiabatic process. Um, and I don't know, that's the only thing I can think of on the spur of the moment. Uh, but the way to distinguish between the two is by having two isotherms. So we have isotherm A and isotherm B. Uh, and as a review, you know, B is, uh, has a higher energy at a higher temperature than A. Okay? And so when the process occurs, occurs quickly, it goes from something with very, very high temperature uh, because it starts over here at B and it ends lower here at A. And so uh, it actually loses energy in this case here okay? if we are going from B to A. But if you were going from A to B, it would gain uh, energy because it's going from a lower product to a higher product. Okay. All right. Now here's a really cool demonstration that you, you can do at home. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to blow on your uh, on your hand with hot air. Okay. And then blow on your hand with cold air. Now if you think about this, this is this is something that's really cool that our body can do. But you know, ask yourself this: How can your lungs produce both hot and cold air? Right? Like, does one lung have hotter air than the other? Like, um, is the hot air coming from the side where it's mostly, you know, where the heart is? Because, you know, it's constantly moving and the like, kinetic energy. Like, is that what happens? Um, or does, like, the air change instantaneously within your lungs? Like, so when, when your brain says, I want hot air, uh, your lungs, like, boom, heats up the air. And when your brain's like, I want cold air, boom, it creates cold air. Like, does that happen? Or, you know, or maybe it's even body temperature. Does your body temperature fluctuate? Okay. Um, so think about it. And you know, if, if you don't know, do it. Do it again. All right. So uh, here's the answer. Now this is actually a pretty cool demonstration. Get it? Cool puns. Temperature puns. Um, and it, and it's all because of a combination of our two units. Um, the thermodynamic units and our fluid dynamic units. So when we when we blow hot air. Okay, first of all, we open up the, the opening of our mouth, and um, that allows for the air uh, to come out a lot slower, right? A1, V1. Um, and because the air moves with a slower velocity, okay, the, the pressure increases. The pressure coming out of our mouth, it, it increases. And uh, when the pressure increases, according to the universal gas law, assuming that uh, volume, uh, the moles, and the constant are constant, that means the temperature has to be uh, increased because um, they are... Uh, directly proportional. Now, same goes for the opposite. If we decrease our area of the mouth, right, we, we decrease the area that the air comes out, um, continuity formula, uh, the velocity increases, and if the velocity increases, the pressure goes down. And if the pressure goes down, then it means the temperature also has to go down. So, okay, that's why you can blow two different temperatures. All right, so with our PV graphs, um, there's, I mentioned this before, but it's important to know what the different points represent. Uh, the coordinates, the pressure, and the volume um, can let you know which point has a higher energy. So if we were to multiply the coordinates for point A, multiply the coordinates for point C, and multiply the coordinates for point B, uh, whatever has the greatest product, okay, the resultant of the two multiplications, um, is the point where there is the most amount of energy. Okay, most amount of energy, of course, uh, the most, um, the highest temperature. Okay, now if A and B, if that red line is a isotherm, we should be able to answer this question pretty easily. Obviously, out here in point C, that has the greatest y value and the greatest x value. So when you multiply uh, the greatest y value and the greatest x value, you're going to get the greatest product. Uh, and A and B, um, they are actually equal because they're an isotherm. Okay. Now, the equation that you should use is the 3 halves times PV, uh, or sometimes 3 halves NRT, uh, based on what the problem gives you. But if you were to do that, we will get that the C point is the greatest, and A is equal to B. And A is equal to B because they are isotherms. All right, uh, here we have the, the same cycle, but it is shaded, okay? To find the work done in this cycle, you have to find the area that is enclosed within that shape, okay, within that polynomial, and that'll tell you the work done by the, the cycle, or by the gas as a whole during that cycle. And if the cycle goes from A to B, and from B to C, and then C back to A, you should be able to determine the, the work done by adding and subtracting um, the numbers. Um, so it's important to keep a couple of things uh, constant. For example, if you know that from A to B, the volume is decreasing, that means that there is work done. Uh, excuse me, from A to B, the volume is increasing. That means the work is done by the gas. And so the area under the curve from A to B would be right around here, okay, if you could follow my mouse. Um, that would be a negative value. 
And from B to C, there's no work done. So we have negative value plus zero. And then we have the uh, work under the curve from C to A, which is, if you follow my mouse pad, all this area, even down here. Okay. Uh, and that's when the volume is decreasing. And because the volume is decreasing, what that means is that the, um, that the gas is, uh, there's work being done to the gas. So the work value will be positive. So if you add this negative value with the positive value, okay, it's a subtraction. And the resultant will be the shaded area here in this polynomial. Okay. And that's how we determine the work. All right. Now let's go over the, the laws of thermodynamics. Okay. Um, if you haven't watched the, the video on the laws of thermodynamics, please uh, go ahead um, before you watch this. So the zeroth law was actually the last law that they came up with. Uh, it states if two thermodynamic systems are each in thermal equilibrium with a third, so if you have three objects, okay, and uh, these two objects are in equilibrium, then that means that if they're all connected, that all three objects are at the same temperature. All right. So with a graphic, it kind of looks like this. A has a lower temperature than B. The molecules in A and the molecules in B will collide with each other at the junction. And what I mean by junction is this middle point right there. Okay, the molecules will constantly be hitting each other. Um, the molecules in each container will then continue to collide with the other molecules within the container so that the energy from the two containers, because remember all those molecules have some kinetic energy, and when they hit each other, they transfer some of that energy. Uh, that will go on and on and on and on for an infinite amount of times until equilibrium is reached. Now, I say the word until very, very loosely. Okay, what I actually mean is that equilibrium will eventually be reached. But even after equilibrium is reached, the molecules are still colliding with each other, still transferring energy. So the key points, collisions happen randomly. That is very, very important. The flow of energy also happens randomly. Okay, so if I were to go back to this diagram, the energy within A, the molecules within A, are still bouncing off of each other. Okay, and they're still interacting with each other. Same with the molecules within B. The energy... Um, within the molecules in B, are, they're, they're still colliding, they're still exchanging. It's just that um, the interaction between the two, A and B, that's where the greatest exchange happens. Okay? Uh, we say that the heat flows from high to low, mainly because the higher energy in the molecules will cause more motion. So the keyword here is that the net energy, the overall energy flow, will be from high to low. Okay? And that's because there's more motion. If there's more motion, there has to be more collisions. Um, well, collisions happen randomly. Oh my gosh. Uh, which also means that the flow of energy happens randomly. Uh, energy can be transferred from low to high. That can happen. That can happen. Because the, the slower molecules can hit um, molecules on the higher side that are moving a little bit slower. Okay? So there can be a transfer. Uh, or it might hit it where there's a little spin. And you know, the important thing is that it can happen. Um, the collisions occur throughout the entire time the two systems are connected. Okay? It's as soon as they touch, the collisions are happening. And that's because even when they are separated within the, the chambers themselves, the molecules are colliding with each other. So as soon as you connect them, boom, instantaneous collisions. Okay? Um, even after equilibrium happens, and this is very important, uh, the energy is still transferring back and forth. Collisions don't stop just because you reach equilibrium. And that's because of the kinetic molecular theory, uh, all objects move, and also the third law of thermodynamics, which means that uh, no molecule can reach zero Kelvin, zero energy. Okay? And the most important idea out of all this is that the net energy always goes from hot to cold. Okay? That means if you were to add up all of the collisions and the transferring of energy, it will always look as if the hot energy went into the, the cold side. But in reality, it's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. All right. Uh, if we were to graph this, um, if we have A and B here, now let's, let's think about it. Uh, red has a lower temperature because it has a lower number of molecules, and those molecules have a lower average speed determined by the pinnacle. Uh, and blue has a lot more molecules, and it has a greater pinnacle uh, for the average speed. So Ke equals 1 half mb squared. The velocity, or just average speed, is the greatest for blue, okay, with this x value uh, versus a red, which has a lower x value closer to 0. Okay. Uh, my question to you is, when the two gases are released into each other, uh, what would the equilibrium curve look like? Uh, will, it, will the peak be closer towards the blue curve or closer to the, to the red curve? Okay, so think about it. Um, the blue curve it has a higher overall temperature than the red. All right? Now, if you think that it looks something like this, then you would be correct. The, the green curve is closer to the peak of the, the blue gas. So what that means is that, uh, let's say that the blue gas was 100 Kelvin and the red gas was like 10 Kelvin, when the, when the two gases mix, uh, assuming that there were a lot more blue molecules, uh, the, the end resultant temperature will be a lot closer to the 100 Kelvin, like something like uh, 85 Kelvin. 
Okay? And that's because the overall energy, um, there was a greater uh, energy within the blue, the blue gas. All right. Notice one heat. Uh, heat can flow or be transferred, but heat is not a liquid or a gas or a solid. Uh, a lot of people will confuse heat as a liquid or a gas because uh, if you look at fire, it kind of looks like a liquid, I guess, and people are used to um, gases igniting. Uh, so that's where the misconception comes from, but it's important to know that heat is not either one of those two. Heat can never be described as something that can be possessed. You can't own heat. You cannot own heat. Um, so my example here is saying that a metal strip has 300 joules of heat is, is absolutely the wrong way of, of describing it. Instead, you can say the metal strip is 300K. Like, um, the descriptor here is that it's a temperature. Okay? Now, every once in a while, they will post a question like this on the exam you know, just to get you. Okay? So temperature is something that can be uh, possessed. It's, it is a descriptor. All right, the first law. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That's where the conservation of energy comes from. Uh, it can only change from one form to another in any sort of process, whether it's from kinetic to potential, uh, breaking chemical bonds for potential kinetic energy. Uh, the list goes on. Um, the total energy of the universe will always remain the same. Okay, so the amount of energy that the universe started off with is the same exact amount of energy that it will end with. Uh, and that's where the whole idea of entropy comes in. Okay, once we use up the energy, it will, it will still be there, but it'll be in a form where we can't use it. Uh, so for a thermodynamic cycle, the net heat supplied to the system equals the net work done by the system. Um, and it looks something like this, okay, where delta U is for the energy, Q is heat, and W is work. Okay? And we, for AP1, use this to describe mainly gases. All right. So here's a couple of reminders. Um, it's mainly for gases. If the gas does work, the value inputted in the equation uh, is put in as a negative. If there's work done to the gas, the work value is put in as a positive. Uh, same with the idea if there is heat added to the gas, the Q is positive. But if heat is taken away from the gas, the Q is negative. Okay? Um, imagining how to add heat to the gas is easy. Like, you, know, you light a fire underneath of it or you put it on a hot plate. Um, taking heat away from the gas, you either have a conductor, like a metal plate, so that heat flows out of the, the gas or the system into the plate, or you have like an ice bath, okay? something that draws away the energy. All right, the second law. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics is the entropy law, a real philosophical, philosophical uh, head scratcher. So it says the entropy of an isolated system, uh, not in equilibrium, will tend to increase over time, approaching a maximum value at equilibrium. Now, the idea of equilibrium here uh, is that the entire universe wants to get into this equilibrium state of um, a, a state where it, all the energy has been used up, um, where it's, I'm going to say this in quotes, and it's, it's best not to think in terms of quote-unquote orderly versus disorderly. Like, it's easiest to describe in orderly versus disorderly, but it's best not to think in that way um, because there will be scenarios where that doesn't necessarily make sense, okay? So the way I want you to think about it is how is the heat moving? Okay, how is the heat moving? Um, the entropy of the universe uh, will always increase, okay? Over a very, very, very long period of time, it will always increase. Um, the entropy of a system can decrease, but in order to do that, um, Think about the work energy formula. There needs to be work done. And when there's work done, there's always heat given off. And that heat contributes to the entropy of the universe. So no matter what, the entropy will always increase. Okay? Uh, and this is what we call the heat death of the universe. All right. Entropy. So the easiest way to think about this is the water scenario. We have ice, water, and we have steam. Uh, solids, liquids, and gases, respectively. So if you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, the entropy of the system always increases. And that's because in order to go from one, uh, one state to another, uh, energy must be added to the system in order for that state-based change to happen. Okay? So wording is very important. We can add energy in order to increase entropy. We cannot say we added entropy. Right? We can add energy, but we cannot add entropy. We can cause it to have more entropy. We can increase entropy, right? All right. Um, and also, this works in reverse. Uh, in order to go from a high energy state, like a gas, to a liquid, which is a lower energy state, uh, you need to get rid of some of the energy. Okay. So if you get rid of the energy, you're decreasing um, that system's entropy. Okay. Uh, it has less of that heat energy. All right. Now, 
whenever it goes from one state to another, a little tiny bit of energy is lost to the universe. Uh, and this is why the entropy of the universe is always increasing. Now, if, you're, if you really think about this, right? So if we, if we have water and you have that water and you put it in a freezer, okay? You have the freezer uh, over maybe like an hour or two, that water will turn into, it will turn into ice. So if you, you gotta ask yourself, how did that happen? How did that water turn into, into ice? And what we're taught in, uh, in science is that ice has less energy. So in order for that to happen, we need to get, we need to take the energy from the liquids. So when we take the energy from the liquids, we have to put it somewhere. Um, and that somewhere is the back of your freezer. Okay, so I don't know if you know this, but if you take a look at the back of your fridge or your freezer, um, for something that keeps things very, very cold, the backside is actually pretty hot. And that's where all the energy goes to. And of course, uh, that heat escapes into the air. And once it's in the air, it's gone. We can't use it. Congratulations, you're killing the universe. by having ice cream in your fridge, freezer. All right, so entropy on you. Um, an analogy that I like to use is uh, your body. Okay, you are a system with... Um, with high amounts of uh, requirements and processes, right? Your, your organs have to function, your brain has to, is constantly burning calories, right? Um, so we can say that your body, because it's, it's not where the universe will eventually take it, uh, death and decomposition and dirt, you are considered to have low entropy, okay? And you want, it, you want it to keep it at that state. And... Um, but the thing is, is that we are constantly exhuming heat, okay? So we are constantly losing energy. Uh, and we're constantly losing energy, and that energy will always be escaped into the universe. Um, because like right now, I'm, I'm sweating a bit, and so I'm helping the universe uh, die a very slow and painful heat death. Okay? Um, this is very similar to how automobiles use uh, gasoline, okay? Uh, the gas gasoline comes in a uh, very compact and chemically chemical potential form, okay, and then you, you ignite it, and that ignition helps your car run. But the sad thing is that most of the gasoline is actually wasted. Um, very little of it is actually used to power your car. Uh, most of it is, is gone to the universe in the form of heat. That's why engines get super hot, because there's tiny little explosions happening all the time. All right, um, so because entropy is so important, one more infographic here. Uh, now, delta S, it stands for entropy. Uh, we haven't used that in our physics class, but here we go. From a solid to a liquid, the entropy increases, okay? Greater than zero, greater than zero. But when it goes from a gas to a liquid or a liquid to a solid, the entropy is less than zero, okay? Uh, the entropy decreases, all right? All right. And last but not least, we have the third law. Uh, the entropy of a system approaches a constant value as the temperature approaches absolute zero. Now, the important part is that no system can be at zero Kelvin. We, as human beings and curious creatures, we, like, we want to take a dip in the dark side. Like we want, to, we want to get there, and that's where things get scary. But according to these laws, we cannot get there. Because if you get there, you break the kinetic molecular theory. Uh, you break the third law. You break the first law. You break the second law. You're breaking all sorts of law, and the universe will, uh, will serve you up in court. Yeah. Okay. Um, important things. Uh, the third law really ties everything together. Um, because if you have zero Kelvin, that means you have no energy, which violates the idea that all objects are moving on an atomic level. Okay, uh, which also breaks some quantum stuff, which states that if you are able to locate and stop an atom, um, then you don't know how fast it's going, but how can it be moving if it's not moving, right? So it gets, it gets really confusing. Uh, so the idea is you can't know where it is and know how fast it's going. Um, and so if it's not moving, then you know how fast it's going, and that just, like, oh my gosh, physics. All right, the important thing that you need to know uh, are these graphs. So the third law of graphs uh, look like this. Okay. Notice how it never reaches zero Kelvin. Okay. It no, never reaches zero Kelvin. Okie dokie. Uh, either by decreasing the pressure or increasing the pressure, you cannot reach zero Kelvin. Okay. And you'll be asking Mr. Lee, isn't that zero Kelvin right there? I'm like, no, this temperature is along the x-axis and zero is over here. All right. Woo! Conduction. Okay. So we're going to go over the three forms of heating. The first one is conduction. It's given to us with this beautiful equation. Okay, uh, some kinds of questions that you might get is, you know, how can you rearrange these variables so that you get like a slope formula or uh, it could ask, you know, what's the relationship between heat and temperature and they are directly proportional because they're on opposite sides, right? So if you add more heat, that means the temperature goes up. <gasps> Who would have thought, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, conduction notes. Uh, good conductors allow for heat to be easily transferred throughout the material. Uh, bad conductors do not. And they're not called bad conductors because, you know, that's mean. So we gave them another name. We call them insulators. 
Okay, uh, and the important thing about conductors is that it requires contact. Okay, when two two materials touch, uh, there will be a transfer of heat, and that's because our our molecules and atoms are constantly bombarding into each other. All right. Um, so if we were to keep, so let's say we had we have these metal bars like like we did in the lab, and we heat up one end. Okay, and we had a very special thermometer, and that thermometer was uh, allowed us to take the temperature at different points. Okay, we would see that. Um, the point where we heat it, right, it has a certain temperature, but then it would decrease as it went along the length. And the uh, important idea here is the is, is a slope, okay? So if we take a look at the, the red slope, uh, the material looks pretty uniform in temperature versus the blue slope, okay, which is there's a drastic change in temperature. Um, and that's because heat in the, the red material uh, was allowed to move freely. Okay, it was allowed to heat up the entire thing versus the blue one where uh, it's pretty resistant. So we can consider the blue one to be more of an insulator versus the red one. Okay, and um, this will be the length versus the, the time, right? So how does heat move along that material? So as the longer it takes, okay, the longer it takes uh, for the, the material to get heated, okay, which is down here, okay, this one is taking a longer time let's say that y point right there is the maximum length okay so for this blue curve to reach that point it's going to extend beyond what i drew compared to the red one which is going to reach that y, y point like it's, it's already there right and so the red one shows that it's a good conductor it's able to be heated up rapidly versus the blue one all right convection uh i showed this demo in class with the hot water and the cold water um it depends on the principles of density and pressure uh hot air is less dense um, because the molecules are constantly moving around, and in that space, there's not a lot of molecules, so there's less mass there within this volume. Uh, and cold air sinks because cold molecules don't move around as much, and so they're just kind of hanging out, you know? They're just there, kind of like my, uh, my brother, yeah, just sitting in the basement, not doing much. All right, uh, and this is how clouds are formed, and um, how our rooms are heated and cooled. All right, radiation. Now this is something cool. Uh, all objects are able to give off some form of radiation um, in one way or another. And for us as humans, we give it off as infrared. And there are very few animals that are able to see in infrared. Um, there's snakes. Snakes do this. And I've got the other one. Okay. Um, but the, the, the sun is able to heat us up with, infra, uh, with UV, infrared, you know, the whole nine, with the radiation. Okay. And you might have seen these cameras, which allows you to see in infrared. Uh, and that makes the human look like it's glowing, and that's because it is. Now, I want to point out a couple of things. One, you can see the hand. Okay. The infrared, uh, the heat signature is bleeding through the paper. Okay. Um, you can see that the, the head is a really hot place. The hands are pretty cold, and the glasses... The glasses are also cold because they themselves do not emit the infrared that we as humans do. Okay. Um, all right. So here's a final, uh, final graphic that wraps the three different ways of heating uh, nicely. Uh, the fire radiates out heat. The water, uh, the bottom part is hot, the top part is cold. So there's the convection. And the heat travels through the metal uh, into the handle, and that person just got burnt. Cool. All right. Uh, Thanks for watching. I hope you do well on your exam.